How do we get to this 10 trillion? Is NVIDIA becoming the most valuable company in the U.S.? Or do we see these other tech giants moving higher along with it? Yes, and let me remind you that I had said years ago that App, uh, NVIDIA would surpass Apple to become the world's most valuable company. Now it's nipping at its heels. What is going on with NVIDIA that is unique from a company like Apple or Microsoft is, as you know, it's fueling the AI infrastructure. This is really important to understand because Hopper architecture drove us to about 90 billion data center revenue. NVIDIA is quickly releasing the next architecture. It's called Blackwell. It will be out before the end of this year. That, we think, can bring us to a $200 billion data center by the end of fiscal year 2026, so that's calendar 2025, meaning that this next cadence of generation, which is Blackwell, will equal or slightly exceed Hopper. And there's reasons for that, which is that it will empower and enable trillion plus parameter large language models, which is exactly where big tech is trying to go. So those components all together equal a very large hardware data center segment. Then we have software coming, okay. which I could talk at length about, but I won't, I'll be brief. <laughs> and then the third one is automotive. So we have a lot coming. This is very, very early for NVIDIA and there's a few layers to it. All right, so a lot coming. By the way, Beth, I know you're in Colorado, which I know is coach prime country, a lot of optimism. I know you got to believe out there. But your price target is uh, kind of pending on a lot of assumptions, if you will. So one of the assumptions is that the estimates for data centers are too low and also that the market for the TAM, I should say, for chips is also too low. You cite Lisa Sue and other chip CEOs saying that basically the market's even bigger than we all think. Isn't this just a little bit bubblish? I mean, just this idea that no matter what the estimates are, there's even more room to go. I'm glad that you brought up Lisa Su and then Intel's CEO as well. Lisa Su has a $400 billion data center segment by 2027. What, our, what my forecast is, is that NVIDIA will take the lion's share of that. Intel has a $1 trillion TAM by 2030. Again, my forecast is NVIDIA will take the lion's share of that. So I okay. think that those TAM estimates are in line. And what now needs to be decided is who will get how much of the pie. So you're also saying that their moat is sustainable, even as we see, you know, a real build out of chip production here in the United States. And of course, other companies are trying to catch up, not to mention the number one comp the number one customers, I should say, are making their own chips and actually becoming competitors. So how much longer do you see this moat lasting for another five years or does, does this moat continue to last because you feel like NVIDIA is continuing to ramp up? There are a few elements there, which is that when big tech makes custom silicon, they're mainly doing it to optimize their own applications. They won't ever become merchant. Uh, they won't ever compete on merchant silicon. So what that means is they're not gonna commercialize and sell chips the way that NVIDIA does. So NVIDIA has an open runway there. Secondly, the CUDA software platform is what developers learn on. So similar to iOS is really what locked people into the iPhone because developers were developing applications for the iPhone. The same thing is happening with NVIDIA, which is that the CUDA platform is what software uh, engineers, AI engineers are learning in order to program GPUs. So that helps lock them in. And that combination right now, I'm calling it an, an impenetrable moat. So wow. this is not a moat that I see um, being something that would crumble or erode. Although I do think that, you know, let's fast forward 2030. Wait, wait, let, let me, let me just stop. Impenetrable sure. moat, $10, billion mar uh, $10 trillion market cap, billions, nothing, $10 trillion market cap. I think we do have to play devil's advocate. I know Kramer watches. Uh, he's going to send me an email right after this, but we got to play devil's advocate. In fact, somebody already did it for me. KKR's Henry McVeigh spoke to us last week, and he downplayed the role of AI when it comes to the increased productivity and increased profitability. I want you to listen. I want to get your take on what he has to say. Okay. Right now, we're seeing a surge in productivity. It's not AI driven. It's driven by the CapEx that we saw during COVID, and that's led to more corporate, uh, corporate profitability efficiency. Yeah, all right, your take. It's not necessarily AI, which is seeming to be the consensus. I think a lot of us thought AI is what's help, really helping this earnings season. He says it's CapEx actually from a couple of years ago during the pandemic. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Strong disagree. CapEx has been going up uh, phenomenally. Just happened again. Q1 reports came in for full year guide. But ultimately, what we're having two different discussions, and that's where people are getting confused, is that corporate productivity is one thing. Big tech is an entirely different thing. Meta can optimize social media and ads without having to go out and, and market productivity to customers. 
Google, obviously, we're going to see that with the search engine. Apple has a wide runway on what they can optimize. Uh, Tesla is another one. Lots of R&D going on at that company. They don't need to go out and sell productivity like an enterprise company or an SMB. So those are two very different discussions. Big tech is already seeing the benefits.